Uh, welcome to the last talk of this session. You made it, whether you're just joining today or whether you've been with us the whole time. I hope you are um, fully embodying the spirit of Seshi and uh, completely realizing the Tathagata's true meaning, which is uh, what we're trying to do here. Um, I guess I wanted to start off just a reminder and an apology for all the talking I've been doing. These Dharma talks are just so silly. Trying to, trying to talk about this stuff. But, um, you know, just trying to, we just got to be authentic and honest in our speech. And uh, I always really like to rely on the old Zen adage, I hope there's enough water in the Pacific Ocean to rinse my words from your ears. And I really mean that. Um, yeah, receive, you know, it's like Jongak, our, our good Dharma friend and guest speaker. He says, we should hear Dharma talks like uh, leaves in the wind. And the wind rustles whatever leaves it's going to rustle. And then it goes away. So, yeah, I just... Uh, I'm sorry for all of my meaningless words, and I hope that they rustle some kind of leaves in some kind of way. But uh, the wind that I've been blowing for the past few days has been around these eight awarenesses. The Buddha's last teaching, Dogen's last teaching, these eight means to enlightenment very much like the Eightfold Path. We've seen a lot of similarities between the two. And so, yeah, so far we've looked at freedom from greed as a means to enlightenment. Um, satisfaction, awareness of satisfaction. Um, the serenity of solitude, diligence, uh, preserved awareness of the Dharma, keeping our awareness alive, uh, and uh, samadhi, the practice of samadhi, concentration, losing ourselves in every moment, and seeing every moment as the teaching of the Buddha. So we'll talk about the last two today. Uh, Dogen says the seventh means is practice of wisdom. Wisdom is the result of having practiced according to the Dharma that one has heard and considered. I guess the thing that really sticks out to me here is talking about wisdom as a result. Um, and that's kind of a theme that I think comes up as we'll talk about this. But practicing wisdom, I don't know, it feels as I, as I read and think about this uh, teaching, it kind of paints wisdom as like a passive thing, a passive practice. Whereas like gaining knowledge, going to school, studying, taking notes, that's kind of like an active, like gaining thing. I have gained this knowledge and now it's mine. I feel like the way Dogen and the Buddha are talking about wisdom here is kind of just allowing, allowing wisdom to simply just be, right? And uh, as I've quoted a bunch now, the Buddha, when he gained enlightenment, said, all beings are the wisdom and compassion of the Tathagata. It's what you already are. It's what our life is, is perfect wisdom. It's 
not about learning anything. It's not about walking away from session with some kind of like insight that I'm going to now hold on to and it's going to change my life. Let that go and just allow the wisdom to be. It's a passive process. See the wisdom that you already are. So that's what Dogen says. Wisdom is the result, the natural byproduct of having practiced according to the Dharma that one has heard and considered. And of course, from our talk yesterday, Dharma means not only the teachings of the Buddha and what we read in our books and what we hear uh, from Dharma talks, but everything, every last piece of minutia of your life is the Dharma. So the Dharma that one has heard and considered. So already just today, we've been awake doing our thing for what, almost nine hours now. Think about how much Dharma we've encountered. Every little tiny drop of rain is the Buddha's Dharma. There's wisdom there. Uh, the Buddha said, monks, a person of wisdom is free from attachment to greed. So a lot of this Buddhist teaching from the Buddha's words to Dogen stuff to Tibetan and Vipassana teaching, they all really do. Um, they're cyclical and circular and they overlap. So he started with freedom from greed and now he's saying a person of wisdom is free from greed. Engage, this is the Buddha still, engage in self-observation. Isn't that interesting? How do we gain this wisdom or how do we allow this wisdom to be? We observe ourselves. I think a few of us have talked about being an observer versus a participant during Zazen. Can we observe our mind? Can we observe our trains of thought without necessarily participating in them? That's what the breath is for. That's what the koans are for. And of course, Dogen's most famous line, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. And that study isn't so much like psychology where we like study what makes me up and what are the patterns and how did my trauma and this is the polyvagal and no, no, no. That's all really great and very helpful stuff. But I think Dogen's study of the self is more like the Buddha says here, observe the self, be mindful of the self and allow the wisdom from that observation to just be without walking away with some kind of like insight that you're going to go write down in a journal, which is great too. Having insights that really stick with you is awesome. But I think this wisdom that we're talking about is not that it's not reliant on having some kind of thing to hold on to. It's simply the wisdom that arises from observing yourself. Uh, so the Buddha says, engage in self-observation for this prevents loss of wisdom and leads to enlightenment. Sweet. Uh, if you fail to do this, you are neither a Buddhist trainee nor a lay person. Wow. Strong words from the Buddha. He goes on, a truly wise person is like a sturdy ship crossing the seas of old age, sickness, and death. Yeah, old age, sickness, and death, or impermanence, right? Those are kind of, those are the three hooks that got the Buddha. He saw an old person, he saw a sick person, he saw a dead body, and that's what made him embark on his spiritual journey. Um, but, uh, you know, impermanence comes in all forms. Suffering comes in all forms. For me, my major like book practice was 
learning about uh, income inequality. The first time when I was a kid that I realized how unequally resources are dist distributed and it just shook me to my core and I couldn't handle it and then I found Buddhism and um, it made sense. So yeah, true being truly wise is like a sturdy ship crossing these turbulent seas of impermanence and injustice and suffering. And of course, that wisdom, just like the other day when I said of the koan, there's no power gained on the road. This wisdom is not something you can carry with you to like fix everything. This wisdom is all about observing, observing old age, sickness and death, observing how much it hurts when my hair turns gray and I'm coughing and can't, you know, be as active as I used to be or usually am, observing that pain. And so that sturdy ship is not just going through the ocean. That sturdy ship is rocking to and fro and getting tossed around and the waves are crashing the windows but it stays the court. There's a couple koans like that. One of them is, uh, how do you go straight down a road with 99 curves? Another one is an immovable tree in the heavy wind. And so this koan is a sturdy ship through an unsturdy sea. A solid, reliable ship in an unpredictable, <laughs> unreliable ocean of life. What does that look like? Be the suffering. Truly observe every moment. That is wisdom. Don't block it out. Don't say it should be this way. I shouldn't feel that. I should feel this. I should be wiser. I should be the, be whatever is. That's how you deal with waves. You jump with them. So yeah, a truly wise person is like a sturdy ship crossing the seas of old age, sickness, and death. Like a brilliant light illuminating the darkness of ignorance. And that reminds me of that line that we chant every morning in the identity of relative and absolute, where it says, um, within darkness, there is light, but do not look for that light. That's that kind of passive wisdom. Don't go searching for an answer. Don't go searching for enlightenment. Don't go... Um, expecting anything. Just observe, and the light, the light's there. The light's already here. If you go searching for it somewhere else, uh, good luck. Uh, so yeah, this wisdom is like good medicine to the sick and like a sharp ax cutting through the wood of delusion which reminds me of Manjushri's sword, right? Manjushri is that uh, statue we have there, that I, um, image on the altar. Manjushri, Bodhisattva is the Bodhisattva of wisdom and uh, considered to be, you know, one of the greatest figures in early Buddhism. And Manjushri carries a wisdom sword and it cuts through delusion. And one of the things we say is that this sword has the ability to give life and take it away. Um, giving life meaning life. Let's see, how do we put this? Um, 
We talk about no self. We talk about oneness and emptiness. We talk about um, dropping off body and mind, cutting off all delusion and attachments and ideas. That's taking life away. And through Zazen, uh, we can do that. We can feel Manjushri's short sword take our life away. When we really trust our teacher, uh, both teacher and student can help each other take their lives, their lives away, cut through all of these ideas that we have. But it's also the sword that gives life. The sword that knows when it's appropriate to separate. Uh, when to honor our bodhisattva vow to stay in the world of separation. To acknowledge that there is good and bad. That there is me and you. That there is suffering and enlightenment. Um, so this axe cutting through the wood of delusion means sometimes we cut off delusion and sometimes we engage in delusion. Sometimes that's the most compassionate thing to do. It's like that koan I mentioned the other day, delusion is enlightenment, enlightenment is delusion. Totally open to whatever is appropriate in this moment. That's wisdom. And how do we do that? How do we know when to give life with our sword and when to take away life with our sword? Observing, engaging in observing the self. And of course, given that all of this is myself, nothing is excluded from myself. And we're always observing myself, everything, every little raindrop is you saying hello. Wisdom, this is still the Buddha talking. Wisdom which arises as a result of having heard, considered, and practiced the Dharma produces innumerable benefits to advance oneself in the way. The truth, the truth, Ah, every raindrop. Uh, the truth, once illuminated by the light of wisdom, is evident even to the naked eye. Yeah. That's like, a, it's like an anti-philosophy protest to me. Philosophy spends so much time up in here trying to decipher the truth. Um, some religions say you need to study this book and these beliefs to know the truth. And the Buddha is saying, use your damn eyes. Use your ears. You want to know truth? Sit session and see what your knees feel like. It doesn't get much truer than that. Um, so that's the seventh awareness. Wisdom, practicing wisdom, self-observation. The eighth means to enlightenment is to refrain from frivolous speech. Isn't that interesting? I love that. Like the first seven we were talking about, they all kind of like flow together and they all kind of have to, you know, they kind of weave in and out. And then out of nowhere, he's like, oh, and also like, don't speak weird. <laughs> Very interesting, powerful. Obviously, right speech is one of the Eightfold Path, um, but so is livelihood, and mindfulness, and effort. I guess he talks about effort here. Um, but interesting that his last, the last thing he left his students, and I keep saying he, but I don't know. That feels weird to me these days. The last thing they said to their monks um, is refrain from frivolous speech. It's so 
so interesting. All of us, every single last human being that's ever been, even deaf, um, people born deaf, we phonate, we try to communicate. Probably every creature, every sentient being probably does some kind of communication. And so it's so interesting that his last thing to us, um, their last thing to us um, is about how we communicate with each other. Uh, Dogen says, this means to transcend discriminative thought and to earnestly seek understanding of the true nature of things. Isn't that interesting? Refraining from frivolous speech is to transcend discriminative thought thought. Because hmm. we usually think right speech is about discriminating and knowing like what should be said and, you know, who to say it to and when it's appropriate. So that's interesting. I don't really know what to say about that. To transcend discriminative thought. Maybe he's just talking about philosophizing. Get out of philosophizing and strategizing. Maybe that's it. Um, and obviously, the most uh, relevant koan I already mentioned in past talks, but a monk asked Uman, what is Buddha? And Uman says, an appropriate statement. Um, that is Uman's answer. So perfection of enlightenment. What is the best thing I can do with this path, with my life? An appropriate statement. And of course, statement can be verbal. Statement could be a hug. And statement can absolutely be silence. I'm still learning that one. Um, so yeah, appropriate statement versus discriminative, strategizing, calculated statements. Uh, the Buddha says, monks, frivolous speech clouds the mind and will prevent even you from realizing enlightenment. It makes me think of a philosopher named Wittgenstein, who was a 20th century philosopher and his big thing that he added to the philosophical zeitgeist was that speech and, yeah, language and thought are inextricably bound. You cannot have one without the other, thought and language. Um, I'm sure there's other philosophers that disagreed and have wonderful arguments against it. I don't really know. But when the Buddha says frivolous speech clouds the mind, that's kind of what it makes me think of. That um, frivolous speech is inextricably bound and totally spawns from frivolous thought and vice versa. It's almost like people who are clean freaks like me say that, you know, the way you keep your house is the way you keep your mind. I don't actually think that's true, but uh, kind of, a little bit. That's interesting. Just be aware of that. Be aware how everything you say, where is it coming from? What kind of frivolous thoughts? Um, and that's kind of what we do in one-on-one uh, -on -one with a teacher, is we kind of communicate with each other uh, and really discern what's being said from a place of frivolousness. Um, I can't tell you how many people try to fight me on koans. <laughs> koans are not for debate. They're not for fighting through. And it's just so obvious that that fighting comes from a frivolous place, a frivolous place of like 
I am right. I am right. I have to be right. Approve me. And I'm only saying that because I am the worst case example of that. I fought Sason for decades. Still do. Frivolous. So the Buddha then says, quickly cease from engaging in mind-confusing speech. Only those who do this gain the pleasantries of nirvana. This is the meaning of refraining from frivolous speech. So be aware. Be aware of your speech. Be aware where it's coming from. Um, so then Dogen kind of... Uh, concludes by saying, the preceding are the eight great means to enlightenment. Each of these means, having a further eight factors, total 64 in all. In a broader sense, however, the number of factors is limitless. I don't really know what this eight by eight, 64 thing is. Um, I don't really know what he's talking about, other than they're all contained within each other, maybe. Uh, but the point is, the number of factors, the number of means to enlightenment is limitless. Why? Because every tiny raindrop that hits that your roof is the path to your awakening. Um, this was Buddha's final teaching and the core of Mahayana doctrine. He proclaimed them on, at midnight on February 15th. And they were his final words, or I guess these were his final words. Monks, endeavor to seek the way. And he's talking to you, by the way, when he says monks, us, I should say. Endeavor to seek the way, for nothing in this world is permanent. Stay silent for a while, for time is passing, and I am about to enter Pari Nirvana. These are my final words. Kind of nice. Hear the last words of the Buddha on our last day of session. Um, and then Dogen just says something here that I wanted to say. He closes by saying, uh, to contact the Buddha Dharma is no mean feat. And to be born a human is equally difficult. To have done both is extremely fortunate. We can see the Buddha, study the Dharma, and enter the monkhood. Um, I think that's a really nice parting thought. That, uh, you know, I've said before this week that we should all pat ourselves on the back, that we should be proud and, um, feel good, feel good and feel emboldened that we have come here to do this this week. But I also think it's important to see that we're fortunate. We're fortunate to have been struck by something that brought us here. For some of us, that is something philosophical. For some of us, that's like desperate despair that brought us here. Um, for a lot of people in Sason's generation, maybe it was like looking for a community where they could be like spiritual and do drugs. Um, whatever it is that brought you here, that's making you observe yourself and question your greed and your satisfaction and your solitude and your diligence and your, your perseverance and your samadhi concentration and your speech and your wisdom. Um, not everybody gets to do that. A lot of people hear about that stuff and kind of laugh or they say, uh, you know, Choa's into that weird stuff over there. Um, and that's great. Good for them. That's wonderful. Uh, but 
our self, our ego, our family, our society um, are literally built to resist this thing. They're built to resist enlightenment. Literally, the Buddha was born into a situation where his parents and everyone around him were trying as hard as they could to prevent him from pursuing a spiritual path. And uh, his will and his karma um, couldn't handle that. And then we can see what he started. And each one of us is in that situation. And so against all odds, um, we have this opportunity to really observe ourselves in a very unique way, in a very powerful way, in a transformative way. And so it doesn't matter what brought you here. It really doesn't. Um, the fact is, is that we're lucky. And I feel lucky to be sitting session with you all. And uh, I hope you do too. And I hope you take that luck and use it in service to others and use it to uh, allow wisdom to arise and serve you and others as you move on. So remain diligent.